to HSEL. This is our new show, Homeroom. Uh, this is going to be a weekly show every Friday night. You guys can tune in. We're going to be discussing recent uh, topics in esports. Uh, joining me today is going to be Aaron from HSEL and one of our participants, uh, William. How are you guys doing tonight? I'm doing great. I'm doing well. All right. Yep. So um, we're basically going to jump right into this. Um, but before we do, uh, just a little bit about how the show is going to work. It's going to be, again, a weekly talk show. Uh, we're going to have X amount of people. We try to have uh, three to six people on the show every week uh, just discussing recent stuff in esports. If you guys are watching, you will be able to participate as well. We will be watching the Twitch chat, our Twitter. You can use the hashtag HSEL Homeroom and you can tweet at us. You can read our, your tweets on stream and participate in the discussion as well. So if you hear something you want to weigh in on or you want to answer a question that we ask, feel free to tweet at us. Again, hashtag HSEL Homeroom. So, getting right into the first article we have, um, this is from Olympic.org. Um, this is about uh, the new Intel Extreme Masters that was announced. Um, it's going to be in uh, Pyeongchang, just ahead of the Olympic Winter Games in the Olympic Arena. And it's going to be focusing and featuring uh, StarCraft II, but the interesting thing that I saw here was that it's also going to be featuring Steep, which is Ubisoft's um, flagship... Um, Olympic game so it's partnered it's directly partnered with the Olympics they it's licensed so that's gonna be actually played there so that's gonna be interesting there so um yeah thoughts on that I think it's interesting oh I think we lost Aaron there yeah but personally me I think it's gonna be interesting but very well themed as well you know, adding a genre of the sports sports oh. games. <laughs> Aaron, you you we did not hear any of that. You cut out completely. Oh, I cut out completely. Yeah, you, yeah. Like you just, Can you hear me yeah, at all? Yeah, you're back now, but you you just disappear throughout that entire statement. So you want to just say that again? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, what I said was, um, it, it's really interesting that they're breaking out of like the uh the standard norm of the esports industry where it's um. It's just MOBAs, first-person shooters, and real-time strategies, and they're actually trying to introduce uh, a sports game, which is kind of like a completely different genre and kind of on the console side of things to kind of broaden the market. So I think that's interesting. I don't know if Steep is really the game to go with it just because it's licensed by the Olympics, but, I mean, it's it's still a really good step in the direction. I'm also really curious why they wanted to do StarCraft II out of all the other popular esports that are think, kind of dominating think, the market right now. I think it's... That's more of a. I mean, I th I think um, something like a CS:GO with Dota 2, something like that would be more suitable viewer-wise. But I think that they're strictly doing StarCraft 2 because this is um, the South Korean games, and South Korea historically and currently still dominates the StarCraft scene. So I feel like they're going for a game that's going to gear more towards um, the local. Um, person. Yeah, that's true. That's definitely true. They definitely have a really long-standing history with StarCraft and, you know, the dawn of esports with StarCraft 1 as well. But then again, you have to ask, like, do we want worldwide viewership or do we just want something that caters to our Korean market, you know? Yeah, I, mean, um, I feel like even if they went with something like League of Legends, that would be something completely different. But I don't know if Riot would have given the license for that event. I don't know. That, that's That's something that might be a little iffy in the back of my mind. Especially with Riot, they're they are known for being uh, how that be a pain for licensing and stuff like that in the um, official tournaments. But mm -hmm. um, I could see the reasoning behind StarCraft. I don't necessarily agree with it. I mean, looking at games like Dota 2 and other MOBAs that are just infinitely bigger than the StarCraft 2. I mean, StarCraft, as much as people hate to say it, really is a dying game esport right now. I would say it's necessarily a dying yeah. game, but in terms of esports, it's it's falling off. Yeah, the viewership is really falling off. Like, even if you just go onto Twitch right now, the amount of viewers is really, really is falling off. Like, when I was starting into esports, StarCraft was the number one game. That was the go-to game, StarCraft 2. And also still StarCraft 1 at the time. But League of Legends caught up fast. And once League of Legends caught up, StarCraft just went by the wayside. I think a lot of their player base moved over to that game, especially in the, the Korean sector. Yeah. So... I don't know, but, and especially, well, I guess it's 2018, so it's not that far away, and StarCraft could, you know, it could be a good um, revitalization to the game, having it 
as an Olympic sponsored event, you know. And that could be the idea behind it. ESL trying to bring back because I think ESL was a big holder in mm-hmm. the Starcraft. They're the dominant host, and especially now that um, they're losing a lot of their CS:GO um, stuff to people like E League. They, I mean, they haven't had a major for almost a year now. I think it may have been over, possibly over a year now since they had a major. Um, it's all been uh, DreamHack, MLG, and E League now. So they lost that huge, huge revenue from hosting a Counter Strike major. Um, mm-hmm. Right now, they really don't have much left other than the uh, 250k premier tournaments that they're hosting. Um, yeah. So uh, this could be Intel in uh, ESL because IEM is an ESL hosted event um, with Intel. So this could be a potential revitalization for StarCraft to try to bring that game back into the spotlight a little bit. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Do we know more about Steep? Do we know if that's a game that's been released and is on the market currently, or is that something that's going to be released a little bit later on this this year or next year? I think it is currently on the market. Um, If I'm thinking of the right game, I'm 99% sure I've seen YouTubers playing it. Um, I can Google Mm -hmm. it right now. Um, Yeah, the regular game has been released for like a year now, I believe. (laughs) About maybe half a year. Do do you play it at all, William? Do you have you had any experience with the game? No, not really. I thought about downloading the open beta, but I have watched it be played for at least about an hour. Gotcha. And it's a very interesting game. The physics are nice. People have said it said it's uh, one of the best sports games Ubisoft has made. Cool. Yeah, that's definitely something to look forward to then. If that's Google here while we were talking, I can't find anything on a professional scene in Steep. Are there players that are going to be able to play this? Are there professional players? Is there a following at all to this game that could be yeah. and bring in viewers? Because the problem you're going to have here is that people watching, I mean, yes, people will definitely tune in for StarCraft. It's not completely dead yet. It's still got mm-hmm. viewership, and especially in, in Olympics, people coming are going to come over from other games. Like, I'll watch it if it's an Olympics event. I don't watch StarCraft, but yeah, if it's an Olympic StarCraft event, I'll watch. So, you know what? Um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about that, about the pro scene developing, because if we look at NBA 2K and their pro scene when they first started their esports push with 2K Studios, it was like... Uh, the road to the NBA and everything like that. And they had in-game tournaments and stuff like that. And you formed your own team and, and they didn't have like all these sponsors and all these pro teams that are existing in the esports industry, like TSM, Optic, CLG, all those big names. They didn't have that backing any of the teams and they still really don't at all. And now they're making a push to franchise everything and put it into the NBA leagues. But um, I, my my theory, I have, I have no clue about Steep, but my theory is what they would probably do is do something similar to what they did and maybe have a broad tournament of their whole player base and then maybe fund the flying out of everybody who makes the finals or makes the uh, makes qualifies for the tournament and fly them out to participate on a, on a grand Intel Extreme Master stage. Yeah, that's the only thing I could think of, either that or depending on, I believe it's ahead of the Olympics, so I don't know if people watching the Olympics would be there if they'd have an open an open event there um i doubt that's gonna mm-hmm. be the case just because it's short announcement people already bought tickets to go uh to the yeah. Olympics, like forever ago so i feel like yeah. that's gonna be it um i'm wondering if they're gonna do similar to what formula e has been doing with their e where they'll have mm. professional drivers uh playing the simulator on the simulator against uh the top qualifiers um of amateur sim racers uh, to play against, to actually race against the professional drivers on sim, so it's gonna be interesting to see if we have any of the Olympic athletes competing on here just as a show match. If that's what they're gonna try to do, um, but that could be another option because I know Formula E's done it. I think Formula One may start doing it. I'm not 100 percent sure if they're gonna uh, be doing anything like that, but I know Formula E is really big in that. Every single of their E-Prix, they have a. Um, well, every one of their Grand Prix, they have an E-Pri where the professional drivers race in the simulator against the uh, these people who qualify. So that could be a new yeah. theory to what they're going to do. Because I'm just going through Googling right now, and I don't see any mm-hmm. professional scene. So it's going to have to be something open. It's not like we're just seeing Cloud9, Phase, Optic, throwing steep players in. They just, they just don't exist right now. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, I'm also a little concerned. I don't know. I really don't know the game, like the state of the game. 
but I would hope that it has a very good competitive feel for it to well, I was potentially become an eSport. Yeah, go ahead. I Sorry. I was watching um, trailers and stuff of um, what they're specifically doing for the Olympic Games, and I know they have the ski racing, and they have that kind of stuff, so it's going to be probably four mm-hmm. games, pretty much exactly the same as an Olympic event, so time trial and stuff like that. Um, I'm sure gotcha. the board racing, ski racing, where you're going to be side by side. So I think it definitely does have the potential to become an eSport, but mm-hmm. just looking at other sports games right now, I think FIFA is really the only one with a very large following right now. I mean, I know NBA is trying to make a breakout, but it, right, it's, it's slow. It's sort of starting to come up, but right now people mm-hmm. are, are just not jumping on to the sports games right now and bringing something in to and to open up the eSports at an event as big as a PyeongChang Olympic IEM. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's necessarily the right move. It's definitely going to bring exposure, but if it doesn't go too well, if they don't really have players that are too skilled, mm-hmm. um, just because there's really an unknown out there, just because it's such a new game with literally zero esport scene right now, if it's going to yeah. actually help the reputation for the game in esports or not. You know what? I I kind of disagree with you there. I think it's kind of like a just beneficial all around for them to do this because. It's it's great exposure, and the people that are watching it most likely will not, will not know the game very well, and they'll be like, oh, this is cool, or, oh, this is lame. But most of the cases, I would, I would feel like if they put on a good show, they'd be like, oh, this is cool, I need to play this, and I could potentially become a professional athlete at this. I feel like just having that publicity is really good, even though the, the scene isn't necessarily there yet. It's, it's a step in the right direction, but it's... um. It's nothing. It's not going to be anything like a title like League of Legends and, and CS:GO as we see today. It it needs to gain roots into a community as a competitive game, which it doesn't have now. But this might be a step into making that. Well, yeah, definitely. It definitely could be. I think I don't. I have good faith that it will be able to do well. I mean, they have both mm-hmm. ESL, they got IEM, and the um, Olympic. The Olympic Committee is on. Yeah. There, so they have a lot of very big, very experienced uh, tournament organizers. Yeah. Uh, the Olympic uh, is the biggest in the world. ESL mm-hmm. is the biggest esports organizers, and IEM is experienced all over the place. They have tournaments all over the world. It's just going to be a matter of making sure that it goes smoothly and well, um, or else people are going to look at the game if there's not a good show and be like, oh, that kind of sucks. Um, mm-hmm. That's really the only concern with the game, especially being that it's never been in an esport event before. Um, so there is a decent amount of risk to it, but I don't like just looking at who's hosting it. I don't think we're gonna have an issue with that. I think you're right on that. How it's gonna end up being good. Yeah, just all around positive in general. My um, biggest. Go ahead. Sorry. My biggest concern for Steep is, if I remember correctly, I don't think it has a PvP in terms of a direct match. Like you both are in the same server, and you're trying to race down the mountain. <laughs> As quickly and as perfectly as you possibly could. I think it's more of just going to be how fast you can complete a race. Well, or how fast you can complete hmm. a track. With a lot of winner sports, that's generally not an issue. Because they are single people time trials. So you'll launch one, they'll go down, they'll do the ski, they'll do their trials. And then they finish, the next person will launch. So you don't nec- you're not going to have side by side in most winter sports. Even luge, bobsled, that kind of stuff. Um, you're not going to have multiple people, ra- multiple teams at least, racing in the same place at once. So I don't think that's going to be a huge issue. It's going to be interesting to mm-hmm. see if they add that for stuff like the snowboard racing, where you are side by side going in at the same time. Um, but with winter sports in particular, that's really not a huge issue. Um, in my eyes. Yeah. yeah. Assuming yeah. that uh, winter sports fans take you know interest in it anyway, uh, go on. Yeah, uh, you brought up a good point, you know, with the time trials and stuff like that. I don't know. I, I don't know if I can buy into that as an eSport, you know, because we look at games like League of Legends, CSGO, they're so team-oriented and team-intensive, and I feel like just having a skill-based game a viewership sport too. as a, viewer, as a viewership sport, I don't know if that's going to work very well. Like, what's going to make NBA 2K great as a sports esports game is because it is a five on five game. You have the team that you're playing with. You have the communication. You have that level of of a uh, 
of uh, difficulty there. And then you also have the mechanical abilities when when just single player time trials that's kind of, might not be as interesting to watch number one and number two it's it's uh it's just relying on soul mechanics go ahead sorry and i'm wondering how they're gonna set up the stage for this because you're not mm. gonna, if it's single player you're gonna have one person are you just gonna have one person sitting up on a huge stage just doing a show <laughs> or are they gonna get up walk off and the next person it's not gonna be entertaining to watch it's gonna be slow yeah it's I really, that's the problem that I have with using Steep right now, is it's a single-player game. You're going to be having mm-hmm. to run, unless you're going to have a bunch of people running at once, but then it's going to become confusing when you have all these different people going at the same time in different sessions. They're not exactly starting at the same time, so it may look like somebody's winning, but they're not. And it's going to be confusing if they do it that way, and the really only way to do it is having one person up there at a time. They go, they finish, they get up, next person gets on, they go. You're not going to be able to have the time to do this. It's not going to be entertaining to sit there in a stadium and watch. So it's really going to be interesting to see how they're actually going to host this and be able to put it on a live show. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But then if we also look at what IAM is doing with uh, PUBG, they're hosting a a, a full-on tournament in Oakland, I believe in a month or two. I forget the dates, but... They're actually having a whole whole tournament for PUBG, and it's, they're putting it on as like a spectator event. Um, so I I don't yeah, I don't know how are they going to do that, you know? But with PUBG, I mean, you 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 have everybody playing at once. You're able to do this. Um, I, I'm pretty sure PUBG, you, you, since you do have to directly license with them, I wouldn't be surprised if they do have a specific client, like a LAN um, client, where you'll be able to have the oh, spectator yeah, and stuff I, like that. Yeah, yeah. So you yeah, I totally understand. Going on, stuff going yeah, on. I do understand that, but how are you going to put them all on one stage? How is it going to be interesting to watch well, them play? What I've seen before, um, I know they've done mm-hmm. other live events. I don't know how they set up the stage. Uh, how many people on the server? Hundred. Hundred, yeah. Is it potentially hundred? Yeah. Do they do one hundred for the tournament? Do you know? I don't know, but I think they might. I know, or I mean, it might be squads. What I've I'm not hundred percent sure on how they do tournaments. I don't know. It's gonna be. It's gonna be really hard to. Do I mean what you could do is you could um I mean depending on the stage I mean it's definitely doable it, it would be a crowded stage um you'd basically mm-hmm. have to line them up in rows um have dividers so you can't stream snipe the guys ahead into the side um either yeah. elevate them a little bit or you can do it but it's gonna be hard to do I don't know that's gonna be interesting to see uh, with PUBG how to yeah. do events like that. Yeah. Anyways, uh, back to the back to the discussion. Um, for our viewers right now, if you want to get involved in the discussion, you can use the hashtag HSEL Homeroom. Again, that's hashtag HSEL Homeroom on Twitter, and uh, you can tweet out a question or anything that you want to be read on stream that directly relates to the discussion that we're having right now. Uh, one thing that I'd like to talk about, kind of similar to this, is that Los Angeles secured the uh, the twenty twenty eight Olympic spot. The Olympic bid, and there's a lot of talk about having esports at that Olympic bet as an Olympic event. I know I've seen them pushing that a lot. Um, I personally don't have a problem with them being there. I mean, they're not going to be. Mm-hmm. I I don't see an issue with it. Um, it's it's you know there it's going to be presumably a sort of a separate event, sort of like the Pyeongchang is doing. They're going to have the, mm-hmm. prior to the actual Olympic Games, you're going to have the esports event, and it's just good marketing. You do have the best in the world coming. I do see the argument on the other side, but I don't personally see an issue with bringing esports to the Olympics. Um, I Honestly, I don't, I don't even see a problem with it being sanctioned as an Olympic event. I think that would be really awesome, and the rate that esports is growing at, it could be there in 10 years. Totally, it could totally be there in ten years. Oh, easy. Uh, it could actually overtake a lot of. It's already starting to overtake a lot of uh, traditional sports well, right now. Look at the um, what was it? I believe it was the e. Was it the e league twenty seventeen major had mm-hmm. higher viewership than the Masters, the uh, Golf Masters. Yeah, yeah, it's it's crazy at the rate that it's growing, and I feel like for the twenty twenty eight Olympics, you know, LA being the real home of, you know. League of Legends esports and esports kind of engineering and pioneering. I feel like it would be really great if uh, we could somehow get some sort of sanctioned sanctioned game 
for uh for for esports but there's there's you know there's a lot of bureaucracy that goes along with that and it's it's just difficult licensing a game you know it because yeah, no one owns the game of basketball cool. no one owns the game of you know hockey or anything like that but to like actually somebody owns the intellectual property of league of legends someone owns starcraft 2 yeah. so that, that gets difficult and tricky and, and who knows how long they're gonna they're gonna stay around yeah, and that's why you don't have a lot of esports on TV right now. You have mm-hmm. the, you have Counter Strike right now, and I believe you there's um, there was a Rocket League and Overwatch, um, E League hosting every CS:GO, not every CS:GO. They were hosting, E League has it. I know, Gfinity has one on TV. Mm-hmm. Um, the professional F1 was on. TV, the eSport event, and yeah. then they have the E-League regular season. I don't believe the... Ma- no, the Major was broadcast on... The Majors are on TV. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's going to be interesting. You know, those licenses is kind of tricky. Um, I'm more... Go ahead. Sorry. Um, my largest concern for it is how the people re- will react because, personally, me, if Esports are in the Olympics, I'm fine with it. If they're not, I'm fine with it as well. <clears throat> but there's a lot of negativity towards esports mm-hmm. as much as there is positivity, <clears throat> it seems like. And a lot of people would probably consider putting in esports into the Olympics as a bad move. And people might even you know, protest against the Olympics because of it. That could be a possibility, although probably unlikely, but... Yeah. I think it just has too much traditional hate against it, for lack of a better word. Yeah. And that's really Uh, been the issue, is people shooting it down because of that kind of stuff. mm -hmm. And a lot of them don't understand esports, too, which is kind of unfortunate. Um... Yeah, there's just a lot more that goes on within these games that people know about. And yeah, it's just difficult with those naysayers. But um at some at some point they're gonna realize, oh, a whole generation is coming up with esports and they they consume this more than they consume current sports. And when we think about the Olympics, the Olympics is something that's supposed to bring the world together. And if people aren't behind those games, you're, you're going to lose your mission as an as the Olympics, you know. the The Olympics has always had the mantra, you know, we put away our differences and we we compete in sporting events and have a worldwide tournament. But um, if people aren't behind those 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 sports anymore and they're all behind esports, the Olympics are going to start dying away if they can't they can't adapt. So I don't know. I just I just feel like that if we could unite the whole world. And we're already doing it with like the League of Legends World Tournament and stuff like that. But if we could have it on a platform existing, coexisting with traditional sports, I feel like that would bring the world together even more. A little corny, I know, but yeah, no, I I, <laughs> I, I completely agree personally. But um, yeah, I mean, does anybody else have anything else on this, or should we move on to the next topic? Um. I'm looking at the hashtag too, and I, I don't, I'm not seeing anybody tweeting right. out about um, it. Well, well, if we do get any questions on the Twitch, on the hashtag stuff like that, we will come back to it. Uh, but right mm-hmm. now, we are going to move on to the next article, and this is um, probably going to be a short one, just a quick one. Um, if you guys haven't seen already, MLG has changed their logo uh, pretty drastically. Um, I'm just going to link the MLG.com into the Twitch chat so people can see, but. It is pretty, pretty, it is a lot different. They, they went in a completely new direction. They got rid of the iconic controller um, logo, so you don't have mm-hmm. that red, blue, and white um, with the controller with the MLG there. You have this uh, monotone MLG <laughs> with the G curving around to an arrow. Um, pretty simple. I mean, I think it's, I, I like it. I sort of like it. I have mixed feelings about it. Um, it definitely does look a lot more professional. The new website's a lot cleaner, uh, but I don't know. I feel like I I, I don't like mm, getting rid of something so iconic like that. I don't know. I really don't know. Yeah, I definitely how I definitely know how you're getting that feeling about how iconic logo is, and it's been around since you know the dawn of their company and just the general you know brand. But then again. 
if we look at what happened with the Overwatch League, that the MLB actually filed a lawsuit and a cease and desist letter against the Overwatch League for trademark infringing and uh, copyright infringing. So I, I think this this might be a problem with MLG as well because it's kind of knocking off the MLB logo, if you get what I mean. Oh, so no, no, I, I can see how that can be a huge... It definitely is, but... I, yeah, so... I feel like they should have maybe redesigned it to maybe keep... At least keep the iconic controller that's always been in their logo mm. the entire time. Somehow integrate that controller. Because it, it hasn't necessarily yeah. been... I mean, the whole thing is iconic, but if you think of MLG, you always see the MLG with that controller. Mm -hmm. You never think of anything else. So, I don't know. I feel yeah. like, I just feel like they should have maybe integrated the controller somewhere instead of just scrapping it all, all together. But, I don't know. Um, it's really not a big thing. It, it definitely is mm -hmm. great, uh, good for companies to change once in a while. Um, change is usually good. But, um, yeah. I don't know. I just think yeah, they should have kept it personally. <laughs> I, I definitely agree, and that's kind of like their branding, you know. Um, but again, someone owns that intellectual property, the shape of the controller, so they can't really, they can't, <laughs> they can't actually have the shape of the Xbox controller, or the PS4 controller, that's and true. it kind of and controllers change all the time. So this this controller that we're looking at right now could be defunct in like three years, and then how do you import, how do you reach the Switch market, the Nintendo Switch market, if you're going to branch into Switch eSports? And also, how are you going to represent the PC market? Yes, some people use controllers on PC, but, I mean, you, you want a brand that's all-encompassing of the community that you represent. That's true. And, that's valid. And it's kind of, it kind of, the community has changed because, you know, like in the article, it says that they started with Halo-based tournaments in 2002. So that, that makes sense. They've got, they've got the console controller. To, to reach that community that they have but now they're hosting csgo overwatch tournaments they're expanding their platform exponentially to try to reach these other, other audiences so. yeah I, I get that um i don't know i i just i've just, just, been, around, it, I just, I've just, just been i've just it. been around <laughs> the mlg logo for so long seeing something yeah me too like this is like i feel like everybody has really unless you're unless you're mm -hmm. anybody who has been in esports really in the last year knows that logo yeah like at least yeah. if you've been in esports for at least a year you know mlg you know that iconic logo it's just sad to see mm -hmm. it go i mean we've seen brands re we've see we see brands rebrand all the time um it is always sad to see the logos go but they'll grow on us eventually at least the mlg is a little similar to to the old logo like the m shape yeah, I'm yeah. Glad I mean, they, they kept the they, keep... I, they kept the they I think they kept the same font. They just turned a G into an arrow. Um, yeah, and, and I think oh, they that's just, cool. I, I didn't notice just, that. I think they just curved it up, um, made it a bit more uh, clean. Yeah, and stretched out a bit. You know what? I really yeah. like that. I really like the arrow. That's great. That that that's probably going to be the new branding. Is that is that arrow? That's going to oh, yeah, be no, the new it, it, one hundred percent will be. Is it? I haven't checked out the website. Um, it's sleek. It's it's a really sleek. it's a really sleek yeah. design. It's modernized. Um, Good. They put out a Good, tweet, cause... and that arrow does turn into the branding. So if you look on the article and you click the play on the GIF, um, it, it, oh, it, all, it all goes into the arrow. So that is their branding now. It's ah. uh, actually the arrow. So I, I do like that. I do like that's the good. branding they have going. But, um, yeah, that's really it. I mean, unless there's any other thoughts on this, anything else that people want to talk about, that's really just a quick thing that we, I wanted to get into before we got into the um, final thing that we have for tonight which is actually going to consist of two articles. We're going to start with, um, well, before I get in, there's no more thoughts on this, right? Do you have any thoughts, William? You're kind of quiet, kind of quiet on this one. Uh, as long as the company, <clears throat> excuse me, as long as the company keeps its values, I'm fine with them. All right, it's valid. Well said. All right, yep, so we will move on into the next one, and we're actually going to be um, shifting over into college at level esports, so bringing it a little closer to home for us, um, is going to be talking about the NCAA. We're going to start with um, Sport Techie put out an article. Um, this was from, if it will load up, I don't have the day off the top of my head. This is from October 31st. Um, Olympic stakeholders, NCAA continued discussions surrounding esports. So this does talk about... Um, the a, a little bit of the Olympics, but what it's really talking about here, it's a short article, is how the NCAA is now looking into esports. Now, we know the NIIA has already had their hand in the esports for a little while, but we're seeing 
the NCAA now, mm-hmm. um, talking about reaching their hand into it. And the question is going to be, how are they going to regulate um, this? Because you really can't keep the rules that you have with college athletes right now, or else you're really not going to get many esports athletes. Because right now, if you're an NCAA athlete, you're not even allowed to monetize a YouTube channel. Now, these mm-hmm. esports players, these kids coming in, most of them, if they're good enough to be on a competitive team, a really good competitive team, most of them have a, have somewhat of a following on Twitch or any streaming platform for the majority. Um, either that or they are, they'll get into it. Most of them eventually do. And they're going to want to be able to make money off that, donations, monetize that. And if they're not able to do that, they may just say, you know what, that's fine. I'll just go. I'll join an MDL team. I'll join a premier level team. And I'll eventually work my way up into a professional team. I'll be making money at the same time. Mm-hmm. So is the NCAA yeah. going to be able to enforce any sort of rule or get any players mm-hmm. that are going to be under their current rules where they can't make any money? Yeah, this is kind of a sticky subject and it's kind of been on the back of everybody's mind that I've been thinking collegiate esports for like the past two years um and now that the NCAA is talking about these issues that's great that's a good step forward but um yeah I I, I, I kind of think that some of the NCAA Title IX regulations can stick around um I, I don't think it's great I don't I'm don't, not a really huge fan of Title IX but um I think I think the people that you're talking about that are are good enough to be on a professional team will go to a professional team no matter what. Just like uh, if um, if people were able to be drafted out of high school, like how the NBA used to do it, and don't MLB do still does it, they'll they'll go ahead and just move on. They won't bother with collegiate sports. They're yeah, ready. But, They're ready. And go ahead. but the difference between looking going to the MLB and stuff is if you're mm-hmm. good enough, there's enough teams where if you're uh, take Counter Strike for example. If you're going in, I know this isn't this uh, Counter Strike isn't really a college a game yet, but I know mm-hmm. um, just from knowledge in a game that there you don't necessarily have to go to a pro or even a, an MDL level team. You can still make money in Maine, which is very easy to get into. There's a lot of teams. If I go look at ESEA right now um, and look at these standings just to see how many teams there are, there are quite a few teams compared to even. Uh, professional semi-professional sports so Mm. coming into we'll look at the north american um cisco maine there are currently 113 teams in maine consisted of five players minimum on each team so there's a lot more opportunities to do so so there's a lot more places for these guys to end up in especially if they're going like d1 Mm -hmm. I, i i can see that for sure um but I, I still kind of think that at the end of the day, if you if you give up the earning of the money outside of what you gain at your educational institution, like or if we're talking full ride scholarships, That's you have true. a lot more to gain in the four years that you're going to be in college and be set up for a career and have the platform to compete and showcase your skills and ability to be recruited out of college if you want to go down the esports avenue. I think you'll gain a lot more. Plus, right now when we're looking at um, – the lifetime of an esports pro it's very short so that money that you'll be earning is would dwindle will 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 um be small in comparison to the amount that you probably could be earning if you go through college and then compete in esports there and get your college paid for and then have a higher earning job outside of college if you aren't able to go into esports right away now, you say the life of an esports pro is short, but is it really, though? We don't really see – there haven't been really many at all major players who retire because they can't play anymore. I mean, we've had some recently um, retire because they mm-hmm. got tired of the game. But, I mean, if you look like at people like Taz, Paza Biceps, those guys have – are in their 30s. They have wife and kids, and they're still competing at a top level. So I don't, there definitely is a ceiling – but I don't think it's as sh- short as people think it is. We, I... We're we're finding that the ceiling is growing over time. But if we look at like the South Korea um, esports industry right now, there's a lot of players that aren't making it into the pro scene, especially for League of Legends, and they're they're moving over to North America to find more opportunity here. And 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 there's a lot of players dropping off in skill. Um, after you know, age twenty three, age twenty four, age twenty five, where your um, 
your hand-eye coordination kind of declines over time. So there's the argument to be made there. Then there's also Faker. You know, Faker's three-time, probably going to be four-time world champion of League of Legends, you know. So he's he's been around the esports scene and the League of Legends scene since, like, dawn of League of Legends, and that's a really long career in, in esports. So I don't know. It, it really could go either way, but I feel like there's more value to be gained. But well, I definitely then again, agree with you there, but... Then again, you know, I also personally, me, this is just my point of view. I think anybody should be making money off of their own skill, you know? So if you have a Twitch channel, you should be able to make that money while you're at school and supplement your own income that way. Well, I think yeah, that's totally fair. Let's um just talk about just Title IX in general. Just, just talk about the NCAA rules. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily for esports, but is it really fair for them to say... Yes, you do have the scholarships, but is it really fair for them to say, like, oh, you're not even allowed to monetize a YouTube video, like, that they worked on, that they put hard work in, it's not, it usually has nothing to do with the school, nothing to do with the NCAA, but if they do anything like that, they're not allowed to do it, and they get penalized. Is that fair to say yeah. that? Yeah, some some would make the argument that they, they are in that position because of the school and what they broadcast and stuff like that, and they're making money off of what the school has provided them. If that makes sense, but again, I think I think I think that argument is a little false because I feel like, yeah, that's true, but you're also making a a lot they're of making money. billions I, I, for lack, billions. They're making a lot of money off these kids. The kids should be able to to tap into their own sources of revenue and earn money. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying like actual sponsorships that kind of clash with the uh with the team and the structure of uh, the university team but they should be but able maybe to throw they on should be able to stream their videos and have no problem yeah or there should be some sort of partnership between the university and the students and their twitch channel yeah like we're, we're seeing that now with the twitch student program great guys kevin and uh garvey over at twitch student they're doing some great work for uh the collegiate side of things where they're actually having <clears throat> collegiate channels just like we're doing for the high school students they're having a uh, or high schools, sorry, not high school students, but for the high schools, they're having uh, partner channels for all these schools that are offering esports programs, and they're kind of starting to branch out into the high school scene through the high school esports league. Right. But if there's a way to work out a partnership with sponsors and everything like that, and um, have the student connected to the Twitch account, that that that's sort of the the inner workings that need to happen to to make sure th- the institution and the student benefit from their their talents you know yeah. and uh william looking at you you're currently participating in hcl you are a high school student what is your outlook on <laughs> the title nine stuff um specifically looking at esports um what is your position on if you had the opportunity to play you couldn't make any money you couldn't monetize twitch channels with the current title nine stuff what is your view and opinion on if they had Title IX the way it is right now with esports in college. I definitely wouldn't agree with the regulation <clears throat> because, well, I think it might even hurt, you know, the organizations, the schools involved, because that flow of money going towards them, they can spend, you know, and yeah. it would be centered around the organizations and stuff. Because if they get money, they could, you know pay for stuff possibly in the university or college mm-hmm. such as you know lunches per se yeah yeah i totally agree and i feel like it's hurting the university as well for not having those students on other platforms being able to make money and promoting the university and their teams so like say if you're you're following a collegiate team i don't know rmu or something like that and you want it you want to watch a student that's that's a that's a a college player and you're you're a fan of his you you'd think that you'd want an audience built around that student and his work outside of the team to be related to the team as well if that makes sense and like even if you wanted to uh the streamer or the youtuber mm-hmm. of the content ma- maker could possibly give some of the donations and the ad revenue they receive from the platforms you know, to the school and the organizations, yeah. possibly. 
but this re you know regulation keeps at least a little bit of money flow blocked off and <clears throat> even if it didn't benefit them i don't see how it would be hurting them except for maybe like you have a situation like Shroud, which, you know, an esports professional gets so popular that they don't need to be in the profession anymore because they can literally make so much money from streaming. Mm -hmm. But then you can just replace the talent, possibly. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm just from reading another article we have here um, from ESPN relating to college esports. This is actually the last article. We're just going to keep rolling with this discussion is it does have some more interviews with um, NCAA. It asked them some questions about Title IX. They aren't really giving any clear answers. They said, oh, yeah, it's a hurdle. Um, but something they mentioned is that with Title IX, that I believe um, I'm not super familiar with Title IX myself. I'm not an NCAA athlete. All right. Mm -hmm. So I believe professional and amateur level players are not allowed to be participating in – is that true? If you have professional or amateur status in your sport, are you not allowed to participate on the college NCAA team? Uh, I, I think so. You're not allowed to have any existing contracts so with another team. That's the another question that I'm seeing they brought up is that you know because they brought up the question of ESPN brought up the question of Title IX and mm -hmm. saying there's already kids out here making quite a bit of money and they had to ask the question: Are these kids considered amateurs, professionals? Would they qualify? to actually play and that's another big problem that they're running into is if these kids mm -hmm. are not necessarily just just making the money that is something they're looking at in title line but who is considered an amateur and who's considered a professional because right now professional yeah. is clearly defined but once you get below professional into the amateur leagues it is very blurred on whether these kids are considered professional or amateurs now mm -hmm. because the divisions start to really just blend together very quickly once you get below the professional status. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, I, don't, I, I really don't know. I, I would think that that um, they probably wouldn't want the students of the team to participate in any other tournaments, but then it kind of raises the question, raises the question like, then can you allow a student to participate in ranked solo queue? Because that's kind of a tournament in a way because you get season rewards at the end of it, and is that amateurization? Or if he's a hit challenger tier, is that is that professional level? And are you competing in it in in a tournament there? So it's kind of it's kind of a little confusing there. I definitely can see confusion that can be brought up because no one's going to be participating in two basketball leagues when yeah, they're playing and, basketball for their college team. And there's definitely no way that you're going to be able to tell a kid who comes on to a Counter Strike team, hey, by the way, you're not allowed to queue into matchmaking. You can't play ECA. You can't play face it. You can yeah. only play in team practices and in NCAA matches. Yeah. There's no way you're going to be able to do that. So they're going to have to adjust the rulings for that. Mm -hmm. So it, there's a lot to fix right now in Title Line. There's just not much. Right now with the current Title Line and NCAA, it, will just, it really just won't work, just especially with the amateur yeah. stats and stuff like that, money-making. So it's definitely something they have to make. Um, the NCAA isn't giving any hints to what they're going to be doing. They're just saying it's another hurdle we have to, we have to get over. Um, so there, we really don't see where exactly they're going to be going. They haven't dropped any hints whatsoever yet, uh, which really tells me they yeah. have no clue what to do. Um, they're probably I, trying to make their money, hold on to Title IX as best they can, but they're not finding a way to do it, is my guess. Yeah, I kind of I kind of think if I were the NCAA, I would think of a way of subdividing the NCAA and have a separate esports section Similar that governs the all. AI, AI does. Yeah, ex exactly. It it happened. It's already happened, and I feel like if the NCAA could make that move, it would make everything much easier. And the sports sector can be the sports sector, and the esports sector can be the esports sector. But then again, it raises the question: Why can't why can't a uh, college basketball player have a YouTube channel and make money off of it? That 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 problem's still there, but it, it allows us to compete in esports and keep everything that the esports community has the same as it was. Yeah, and again, it really is a hard, very hard and touchy topic to get into just because of Thailand's existed for so long in NCAA mm -hmm. sports. Um, it's going to be really um, also if you, if they do say, let's say the NCAA does come out and say, all right, you're allowed to keep your Twitch channels, you're allowed to do this. How is the NCAA sports community going to react? Um, 
if they don't change it for them too, is that going to be exactly. fair? And are they going to have to change it for them too? Or is these kids going to be allowed to start making money off like YouTube channels and stuff like that? So that's going to be really interesting to be able to see. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I kind of see, I, I kind of, I kind of see it playing out as like William mentioned that there'd be like a cut, a, a, an agreement that would have to be made between the school the institution and the student on a certain percentage that would go back to the school because honestly if a football player has a youtube channel they're only getting views because they're a football a really famous football player at that university so they kind of see it as you know we're paying this mark for you as a player we, we deserve some compensation for that to support our institution and our programs which is fair i think for the university to say but um i definitely i you start you start well, I guess you could have a YouTube channel without having it monetized, but I would kind of say you kind of you should be limit allowed speech to. there a little bit. Yeah, you should be you should be allowed to to at least be able to make some sort of extra revenue, and even if the school uh, wants to have a cut of it, I, I think that's fair. I think that's a fair thing. Yeah, I mean, so yeah, I mean, if, if that's yeah, I mean, it's it's really hard. It's really hard to do. It's really hard to figure out what's going on. But um, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean that's really that. Those are the thoughts on those are my thoughts on the topic. Does anybody else have anything else, or is that really it for Title Nine? Title Nine, removing it, I believe. Sorry for interrupting. Go ahead. No, that's fine. Uh, <clears throat> I believe, you know, removing Title Nine could open up a, <clears throat> you know, a variety of benefits for the NCAA and the participating university, especially if they ask for some sort of cut in the monetization and the donation. At least rewriting Title IX, not necessarily removing it completely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 much agreed. Revising Title IX could open up a large amount of possibilities, I feel, for making, you know, money to support an institution and therefore benefiting esports in the Collegate, you know, area the Collegate region, you know, a lot. Yeah, well, if that is all the thoughts we have, um, I believe that is going to be it. Uh, just confirmed there's no other thoughts, nothing anybody else wants to bring up. Um, social media looks pretty empty on my end. Um, so, yeah, that is going to be the show. Um, again, joining me today, you can see it up on the screen. Um, I have been Brandon Wright. Joining me was Aaron Hockey from HSEL. Above, on, above the homeroom logo is William, a participant in HSEL. And that is going to conclude um, episode one of Homeroom. Uh, we will be doing this every Friday night. If you guys haven't already, though, make sure you do head over, follow us on Twitter, social media. We have an Instagram, Facebook, all that fun stuff. Um, if you subscribe on our channel, you have immediate access to the VOD to rewatch this podcast, this show. If you have not um, seen the entire episode already, um, for anybody who does not want to subscribe, it will be on the YouTube channel within the next day or two. And, um, yeah, if you guys have suggestions for topics, make sure you tweet us with the hashtag HSEL Homeroom. We will see you guys next time.